Tonight's topic is challenges to democracy, the growth of autocracy in the world. And it's, it's, it's intended to examine what happens to democratic governments when they begin to devolve or slide to authoritarianism. So it's my pleasure and it's my honor to introduce tonight's guest, Dr. Joel Toppin, Chair of the Political Science Department at Hope College, who will help us gain a better understanding into why this is happening in so many places in the world, and also importantly to examine the characteristics of governments as they begin to devolve or slide toward authoritarianism. So Dr. Toppin has been a faculty member at Hope College since 1997. He received his MA and PhD in political science from Purdue. In addition to his work on international relief and development, food security and agricultural development, he has also been honored as Hope College's outstanding professor educator. So please welcome Dr. Toppin. I want to begin with a, a confession of sorts. Um, I am a Democrat. A small d, lowercase democrat, that is. <laughs> I believe in democracy. I'm a supporter of democracy. So um, I have uh, that normative uh, proclivity. That's my normative judgment. I think democracy uh, is a good thing. And so uh, that bias uh, will come through uh, my presentation uh, this evening. Um, but I often make a point to students that we are political Sorry. We are political uh, actors ourselves, each of us. We vote or we don't vote, or we participate in politics or we don't participate in politics. But we are political actors, but uh, we are also students of politics or political scientists. And so I make this point to my students that we are scientists. Uh, so it's not about our opinion or our normative judgments or what we think necessarily is right and wrong, that we try to focus on the empirical facts or the empirical uh, reality of politics and do so as scientists. So we want to uh, put that scientist hat on. So, um, the famous economist and philosopher Amartya Sen uh, famously wrote in his book Freedom as Development that uh, democracy is in and of itself a good thing. But conveniently, uh, luckily, fortunately for those of us who believe in democracy, it's also associated with many other positive uh, things. There's a whole package that comes with uh, democracy. And <clears throat> economic development, for example. Um, gender equality, empowerment of uh, girls and women. Um, a lack of corruption. So these things are all kind of associated with each other and part of the democracy package. Uh, also, democratic countries are more peaceful. Um, they typically have less violence in, in interstate relations with other countries, but also less violence uh, domestically. So um, the kinds of countries that we would want to live in that are healthy, that are wealthy, that are stable, that are peaceful, um, these tend to be uh, the democratic countries. So there's a, a democracy package. So um, that is... Um, part of the reason that democracy is a good, it delivers, um, it, pro it, it, it produces uh, positive social results uh, across a variety of uh, different areas. And so uh, scholars call this the compatibility thesis, that good things are compatible, they go, good things go together. That, uh, and this is fortunate, as I say, that we don't have to necessarily make trade-offs between, say, economic development on one hand and democratic governance on the other. Uh, a few decades back, um, this was a, a, a widely held belief uh, uh, among political scientists as well, that, yeah, maybe authoritarian government isn't the best, but if, uh, if poor countries are trying to lift themselves out of poverty to try to achieve economic growth and development and poverty reduction, that perhaps maybe this is best done uh, with authoritarian government or without uh, a democratic uh, system. But uh, more recently, scholars have uh, concluded that, that, no, this is not the case, that these trade types of trade-offs are not uh, necessary, that uh, good things indeed uh, go together. Um, <clears throat> as discussed in the introduction, democracy is coming under threat 
and we're seeing a democratic recession, uh, as Larry Diamond put it. He's a leading uh, scholar of democracy. Um, this is uh, a few years back. This is a foreign affairs uh, journal cover. Is democracy dying? A global report. Um, this is from the Atlantic. Uh, magazine from uh, 2018 also asking the question, is democracy dying? A recent special issue of the Journal of Democracy uh, says authoritarianism goes global. Right? So this is a, a common theme that we have seen. Uh, here's a, 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 also a recent book with this uh, theme about democracy being under threat. Perhaps even it is uh, dying, the idea of uh, democracy. But the story of democratization, the process by which countries become democratic, uh, and also the process by which they deepen or strengthen their democracies, um, is, is a compelling story this democratization story. It's primarily a feature of the 20th century. If uh, we go back, say, 250 years ago, and we ask how many democracies were in the world 250 years ago, or even 200 uh, years ago. Um, and it depends, of course, on how you define democracy. So for example, if we consider the United States a democracy from its founding, by today's standards, a country that limits the vote uh, to white males who own property, uh, if we looked at a country in the 21st century that had that type of system, we might say perhaps that no, that's not really a democracy. Uh, but if, if we define the United States as a democracy at that time, maybe we would include the UK also. So just one or two or a very small number of democracies globally. And then now, through the 20th century, we've seen the incredible growth of democracy across uh, the world and to the point where um, maybe they were backsliding now more recently in the 21st century, but at the end of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, depending upon your measurement, uh, we could conclude that most people on the planet live uh, in some sort of democracy or another. And most countries of the world, nation states of the world, are democratic to a certain extent. And I should say here also that democracy as a concept is not uh, digital. It's not an either or. It's one or the other, uh, a one or a zero, democracy or non-democracy. But there are shades, there are degrees of democracy that countries can become more democratic uh, or they can become uh, less uh, democratic. And this is a bit of a remarkable transformation, uh, th this story of democratization in the 20th century. Um, and we're worried now, perhaps, that the, the, the tide is turning. Right? It had looked as if the, pro the progress of, and the spread of democracy was inexorable. Um, and during the, at the end of uh, the Cold War in the late 1980s and early 1990s, Francis Fukuyama, a political scientist, famously put forward the thesis that, um, that it's the end of history, right? That history had come to an end. Not that time would stop or that you know, things wouldn't still move, uh, but that uh, ideologically, the human race had kind of settled the, the story of how best to organize uh, at the nation state level. That liberal democracy had won. Uh, and that the other ideological rivals to liberal democracy had uh, lost and had faded away. And I should say here also, when I say uh, liberal democracy or democratic liberalism, I'm speaking of liberalism in a classical sense. All right? So uh, uh, free markets, free freedom of speech, liberty uh, as the basis of, of classical liberalism. So this ideology, um, had seemingly prevailed. Um, and of course now Fukuyama has had to update his thesis and say, yeah, okay, I was wrong. <laughs> I, I jumped the gun on that and we see uh, several uh, uh, threats to democracy around the world. Um, and ideas that mm, there's a better way to organize ourselves. There's a better way to run a country. So the ideological struggle, if we look back through the 20th century, we can identify three major conflicts or wars that allowed for the, the, the spread of democracy and of democratic liberalism against its 
potential ideological rivals. During World War I, at the conclusion of World War I, the dynastic monarchies were defeated. Um, and not that all the uh, uh, countries on the winning side were democracies, but the idea of democracy survived and potentially even thrived. And monarchism as an ideology as being a legitimate way to organize a country uh, began to fade out. Um, in World War II, of course, the main ideological challenger to liberal democracy was fascism in its variety of forms in Germany, in Italy, and in Japan. Uh, and fascism, the fascist states were defeated and liberal democracy survived and, uh, and, and won that ideological battle. And for uh, decades there, fascism then was uh, no longer credible as a, a legitimate way of organizing a country. Now in the 21st century, some scholars, some observers are saying maybe fascism is making a comeback, uh, but I tend to um, say, uh, to, to discount that, certainly not anywhere near what we, we, had, we saw in the 1920s and the 1930s. And then if we move to the Cold War era, we see the ideological com competitor is communism, uh, led by the Soviet Union and its communist allies uh, through uh, mostly Eastern Europe, but through much of the world. And then in 1989, of course, uh, the Berlin Wall comes down and the communist countries of Eastern and Central Europe experience democratic revolutions. Uh, and so communism as a, being a legitimate way of running a country, organizing a society, seemed to have lost uh, its credibility. And again, democracy has survived and has won this ideological battle. And that, that was the context in which Fukuyama reached that conclusion to say, okay, the, all the main ideological rivals to liberal democracy have been defeated and uh, therefore this brings about the so-called uh, end of history. Um, another ideological competitor that we see um, rose, uh, was, came, came to the fore for many of us with the attacks of September of 2001. September 11, and so we have an ideological competitor uh, where terrorists and their supporters are saying, no, we don't want liberal democracy. In fact, we uh, have subscribed to a rival ideology of radical uh, Islamism. And I say ism to say that it's not the religion, it's a political ideology that's rooted uh, in uh, certain radical religious uh, readings. Um, and so uh, we have that rival, or that, that challenger we see in Iran, of course we see in Afghanistan, uh, particularly with the return of the Taliban, we see this, these challenges to liberal democracy uh, through terrorist organizations um, around the world. And then more recently, we have an ideological competitor to liberal democracy in the form of what is called the China model. Um, we don't really have an ism to describe it. It's not communism. Um, it, it's uh, sometimes referred to as state-led capitalism, the so-called China model. Maybe if there's an ism, it's Xi-ism, uh, rooted uh, upon the thinking of President uh, Xi in China. But the combination, the model, if it is the China model, uh, State-led capitalism, which is a bit of an oxymoron, right? Because capitalism is an economic system that is not uh, run by or controlled by or uh, led by the state or by the government. But so it's a little bit oxymoronic. State-led capitalism, uh, but also a lack, uh, an utter lack of political freedom and an utter lack of political competition, uh, lack of political rights of any kind and a lack, including a lack of uh, political, or excuse me, of media freedom or a free press. And so the, the concern among democracy scholars is that the China model is gaining uh, in popularity around the world. And the part of the fear is that it seems for some to be working. Uh, China, of course, uh, since 1980 achieved a incredible economic growth and development. Um, and lifting uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in China. Uh, and then concerns among democracy scholars contrast to the United States. We're beginning perhaps with the 2008 financial crisis, 
Uh, we can go up to the, the botched um, uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan, where the world's most powerful democracy seemed to have lost and seemed to have uh, exited in a, uh, an embarrassing way, uh, in a humiliating way. Um, and so the idea is perhaps that the China model is more attractive to countries around the world than liberal democracy because uh, of the supposed failings or failures uh, of liberal uh, democracy. Um, <clears throat> so what are the threats to democracy? We see democratic backsliding around the world. Uh, this comes from um, the most recent annual report from the VDEM project. It's, the V stands for varieties, varieties of democracy. It's an a institution of academics uh, organized uh, in, headquartered in Sweden. And so they constantly are measuring the state uh, of democracy. And so they use, it's a little, <laughs> it sounds like a political scientist making up words, democratizing, ocratizing, <laughs> cratitizing. Um, so countries that are moving in the wrong direction and countries moving in the right direction uh, and democracy. And so we see in 2002, the picture <laughs> looked a lot uh, more positive for democracy around the world. Only 14 countries going in an autocratic di direction, 43 countries moving in a, a more democratic direction. And then we have essentially have the numbers exactly flipped uh, and reversed uh, here at, in 2022, um, the report came out uh, just recently by VDEM. But um, another uh, way of measuring uh, democracy is the Freedom House organization, a US-based uh, think tank advocacy group advocating for uh, freedom and political rights, particularly around the world. And so Freedom House has a categorization of countries that are free, are partly free, or are not free. And again, the, the, the trend continues in the 20th century. Freedom House counts 17 continuous years in a row that the partly free and non-free countries are increasing in number and the free countries are decreasing in number. Although they are somewhat optimistic that they think that for a variety of reasons that this trend is receding now and maybe democracy will become and freedom will come back on the rise as we move uh, further into the 21st century. So the inexorability of democracy is, is an interesting question, right? Fukuyama thought, oh, it's inexorable. It's, of course, it's going to just continue to grow and grow and grow. Uh, and now we're seeing democratic backsliding, and perhaps maybe the pendulum is swinging uh, and will continue for uh, decades to come in uh, the wrong direction. But if we look at uh, what's happened in Tunisia, what's happened in Turkey, what's happened in Hungary, Venezuela, Mexico, India, all countries that were thriving democracies that have moved in the wrong direction, are backsliding away from democracy. Uh, whether they have reached a full authoritarian status or not uh, varies by country. But the, the case of Tunisia I want to speak of uh, uh, for a second, for a moment here. Um, in 2010, the Arab Spring begins, the so-called Arab Spring. Uh, in 2011, it really gains speed and gains momentum throughout the Arab world. Prior to uh, the Arab Spring, the Arab world was the only region of the world that didn't include any democracies. And so in 2011, it was very exciting to be teaching uh, political science at that time, reading the news every day and seeing these demonstrations, these mass movements for uh, democracy and democratization. In the Arab Spring, we did see successful regime change or that we saw dictators fall in succession in 2011. First to go was Ben Ali in Tunisia. He's removed from power, had been in power for decades. Then we also see democratic, uh, or excuse me, not democratic regime change, but regime change, dictators falling from power in Libya with Gaddafi, uh, in Yemen, uh, and, and also in Egypt. Uh, where uh, Mubarak, the longtime dictator, had fallen. So we, I remember asking my students, posing the question, is this 1989 all over again? 
But 1989, we had a series of democratic uh, revolutions in Eastern Europe and Central Europe. And then the question in 2011, Oh, my goodness, now it is happening in the Arab world, uh, where we see mass protests and demands for political uh, change. And of course, the, the, <laughs> the democratic success of the so-called Arab Spring now has come to uh, a crash. Uh, Egypt's democracy lasted about a year, uh, where they had uh, a a free and fair elections and a democratically elected government. And since then, uh, the military has regained uh, control of Egypt. And the democratic experiment in Egypt did not last uh, very long. The lone success story of the uh, Arab Spring, and I say so-called Arab Spring because (laughs) maybe it was more like an Arab fall (laughs) or uh, turning into an Arab winter, Um, in terms of uh, the return of repressive, non-democratic, authoritarian governments. But Tunisia was the lone success story, Uh, the the only country that had seemingly successfully democratized after its dictator fell from power. Um, And sadly, the democratic experiment in Tunisia lasted a little longer, about a decade. And now we have the uh, uh, current president of Tunisia, Saeed, who is dismantling uh, the d- democratic governments and system of democracy um, in, in Tunisia. Um, and so this is a theme that scholars have pointed to, that it used to be when democracies fell, there would perhaps be a violent military coup. So the military would come in and would remove the civilian government, and they would uh, take power for themselves. But what we've seen more recently cases, and Tunisia is an example of this, is that we have popularly elected leaders who then, once in power, then attempt to consolidate their power um, and put themselves into authoritarian uh, position. A recent book. Um, came out uh, earlier this year, Dictatorships in 21st Century Latin America, Venezuela, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Ecuador, and El Salvador, um, and it highlights this very feature. Um, the political phenomenon, democratic governments have become autocratic governments, not by military coups, but by politicians' manipulation of the system after a fair uh, election. Uh, and so the, the authoritarians... These authoritarian leaders or dictator maybe wannabes or authoritarian autocrat want-to-bes, they they follow a similar playbook. They do the same things. And so they attack any kind of check or limitation on their power, on executive power. So they'll go after the legislatures or they'll disband (laughs) the legislative assembly. Uh, The news out of Ecuador today, uh, I just read um, that the, the... president had disbanded the the legislative assembly. Um, They'll attack the courts, right? So judicial independence is is an essential feature of democracy, that you have an independent judiciary who can check executive power, who can check also, uh, which can check uh, legislative power as well. But it's an important check on, on the executive. And so we see attacks on the judiciary in Tunisia, in Mexico uh, with AMLO, uh, Lopez Obrador, going after the independent judiciary in Mexico. Turkey, also Erdogan, um, has attacked the independent judiciary. We see this in Poland. More recently, we've seen attacks on the independent judiciary in Israel um, w- under uh, the leadership of Netanyahu, that which led, uh, has led opponents to say, this is not just a political, you know, you like this side, we like that side, you want lower taxes, we want higher taxes. This is about the, the, uh, the nature or the existence of Israeli democracy is potentially uh, under threat. So that's a common uh, technique that we see across countries, the authoritarian playbook. But not just going after the, leg- the, the other branches of government or mechanisms of government, the legislature, the judiciary, but also going after the free press, uh, attacking the media, or uh, putting uh, journalists in prison, or or eliminating their license uh, and their freedom to report. They go after uh, academics, they go after scientists, 
They go after elites of any kind. So any political, excuse me, any social actor that would be able to provide a check on the executive, they are attacked or put in prison or eliminated entirely. So this, we see this, uh, as I call it, the authoritarian playbook uh, repeat. <laughs> the story seems the same. The leaders may be different, whether it's uh, Erdogan in Turkey or whether um, it's AMLO, a leftist uh, populist in Mexico, uh, or <clears throat> whether it's in Tunisia or the other countries that I've mentioned, uh, it seems to be a common phenomenon. It have different flavors country by country, but the, but the main theme seems to be uh, the same. We've also seen uh, more recently um, not just democracies that are backsliding and becoming more authoritarian or uh, autocratic, but we've also seen non-democratic countries become even more <laughs> authoritarian. So obviously the two biggest examples are Russia uh, and China. So countries that were not democracies before, but the, le the leaders, the autocratic leaders, Putin in Russia and Xi in China are even consolidating their power even more uh, and, and becoming even more authoritarian. We also see Afghanistan as an example of this with, as I mentioned, with the Taliban returning to power. In Belarus, Lukashenko, the dictator there, has tried to entrench his power, consolidate his power, and is becoming even more more authoritarian, so moving again um, in the wrong uh, direction. And it's interesting that the dictators and the dictatorships tend to stick together. A recent vote at the United Nations uh, to condemn Russia's invasion of a fledgling democracy and Ukraine uh, was supported only by four or five countries that were all dictatorships, uh, Bel Belarus, Eritrea, um, uh, and of course, uh, Russia itself. Um, so, and on the other side of that, we see democracies, also democratic countries tend to stick together as well. The group of seven, the G7, is uh, in the next day or two gonna begin meetings in Japan. The, the richest uh, countries of, of the world, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, France, uh, Germany and Italy, these are the G7 countries, and they stick together and try to support each other, and they support other democracies as well, and we can see that with the extensive support among these countries for Ukraine to resist uh, the Russian uh, invasion uh, of a fellow uh, democracy. Scholars have pointed out what, um, what they call the democratic peace, or the democratic peace thesis, or sometimes the zone of democratic peace. So the idea is that democracies will fight wars, but democracies do not fight wars against other democracies. Now there are some scholars that would refute this, who would say, well, that's not really true, or they just maybe haven't yet, uh, it's underappreciated. Uh, but for proponents of democracy and for widespread democratization, they highlight this democratic peace uh, thesis. So um, if you expand the number of democracies, then you can expand the zone of democratic peace. So after World War II, of course, the United States uh, if, uh, occupies, militarily invades and occupies, occupies and democratizes the two principal in enemies of Japan and Germany. And this is a successful democratization. Germany and Japan have been stable, healthy democracies ever since and not coincidentally have not posed a security threat or th security challenge uh, to the United States that fellow democracies maybe have disputes about trade, about other things, but they're not uh, going to be going to war uh, against uh, one another. So this is another uh, uh, benefit of the democracy uh, package. Now, why is it that democracies um, but that, why is it that countries become democracies? One of the main theories put forward by political scientists is called modernization theory that explains this phenomena. Modernization theory, as countries become economically developed, their economies become industrialized, they experience uh, social change that is part of this modernization package. And they point to primarily three uh, social changes, 
One is urbanization. People tend to leave the countryside as the country becomes uh, industrialized and modernized, leave the countryside, move to the cities. This is significant because when we see uh, mass movements and, and pushes on government for political change, for democratic reform, it's usually coming from urban areas where rural folks, uh, well, no matter where, where in across uh, the world, rural folks tend to be um, uh, more uh, supportive of conservative uh, authoritarian type of governments. Um, and so that, that is an important process, the urbanization. Secondly, uh, education levels increase. And so this is also a good thing for democracy, that uh, all things being e equal, if the citizenry has uh, higher levels of education on whole, then democracy will be much more likely to take hold uh, in those places. And then the biggest uh, factor of modernization theory is the creation of a huge middle class, of an expansive middle class. Uh, and this is really central because, as I said, demands for democracy come largely from the middle class. If we, looked at, if we look at what's ha been happening in Belarus or what's been happening in other democratic um, uh, protests and movements recently in, in Thailand, for example, often it comes from the middle class. And it makes some sense. The elites, the people at the top, they're already at the top. <laughs> so they rarely are making demands for political change in the, in the direction of democracy. Folks at the very bottom of society, those who are living uh, perhaps in abject poverty, are unable, uh, they don't have the resources to demand uh, political change and democratic reform of their government. So it usually comes from the middle class. So, um, and we see the examples of this, we could point to perhaps South Korea, point to Indonesia, Taiwan is another good example. And in fact, we can't point to a fully um, industrialized, modernized economy, as a country with a modern economy that is not democratic. So there is some sort of relation. If we look at this map, the red areas, the orange areas, are places that are generally poorer. The places that are blue are generally uh, wealthier. So there's, there is a relationship of sorts here. But um, it's important to point out, though, that a country does not need to be rich in order to be a democracy. So we can point Costa Rica here in our hemisphere is a great example of this. India is another example of being a poor country that has had a successful and stable and healthy democracy. Uh, Narendra Modi uh, and his BJP party in India now seem to be pushing the country, bringing the country in a more authoritarian direction, less democratic. But certainly it's not the case that a country needs to be uh, wealthy or uh, rich in order to have a democracy. Um, Another potential threat to democracy that I would like to point out is um, <clears throat> um, the, the rise of artificial intelligence. Um, and we really don't know where this is going yet, right? Uh, but the ability to manipulate information, whether visually, whether in uh, words, and have uh, misinformation, disinformation, uh, deep fakes, all of these sorts of things are widely seen to be threatening to democracy, that they uh, represent a widespread attack on truth. Uh, and so uh, the, this attack on truth is makes it very difficult for uh, democracies to function and make it easier for authoritarian leaders to maintain their grip uh, on power. One uh, uh, <clears throat> recent phenomena that uh, scholars have pointed to to explain why this has been happening or uh, why are we seeing this perhaps democratic uh, backsliding or this democratic recession around the world have pointed to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And this had allowed the government to restrict uh, freedoms and to also to increase surveillance. So if we look at China, for example, uh, is a great example of this. Right? So the, the techniques of surveillance, the techniques of control to keep its population under control were uh, ramped up with the response to uh, the global uh, pandemic and that this represents a particular threat. Uh, to them. I did also want to point out, and then I'll, I'll be wrapping it up quickly, and we, I'm e eager to hear what kind of questions that we have. Um, there are some things that are, are work against democracy that make democracy much more like, less likely for countries. And one that I want to highlight now is the oil curse, 
or the resource curse. So um, we'll stick with oil. It might be a blessing that a country is, uh, has a wide access to uh, uh, enormous natural resources, that this is a good thing for a country. It's a blessing. But in fact, we see uh, that that leads to uh, authoritarian government. It often leads to corruption, and it also leads to a lack of transparency, a lack of uh, accountability, and it is a curse in terms of democracy. So we could point to Russia in that respect, of course, Saudi Arabia in that regard. Uh, Venezuela is another example where the massive uh, natural resources have worked in, as, uh, in, in the wrong direction in terms of democracy. Um, Ghana uh, is a, ca a case of a successful democracy in West Africa that about a decade ago, massive amounts of oil uh, were discovered in Ghana and since then, um, perhaps not coincidentally, per since then Ghana has moved in a less uh, democratic uh, direction. Um, where is the future? Where does the future lie? Um, um, I often tell my students that politics is science fiction for the patient. Right? You gotta, we got to wait <laughs> to find out how this is going to turn out. Right? We can't flip to the back of the book or we can't fast forward the movie and find out how it all ends. Um, you know, uh, the, Xiao Enlai, a famous uh, Chinese communist leader, was asked in the 20th century what he uh, thought of the French Revolution of the 18th century. And he said, mm, I don't know, it's too soon to tell. Right? <laughs> so we have to be patient. There's no way of, of knowing how all this is going to turn out. But I remain hopeful. And one of the reasons why I remain hopeful has to do with the increasing uh, growth of the global middle class. And this bodes well for the future of democracy for reasons that I have explained. Um, so if uh, if poverty keeps being reduced, people are joining the middle class, that should create pressures uh, for continued democratization or democratic regime change in the case of authoritarian um, countries. And also, one final point has to do with the universality of democracy. Right? The question of, is democracy universal? Obviously, it's not universal in practice, but the idea of democracy is it for everyone? Is it universal? One um, data point that points in the direction of universality is if we look at the three largest democracies in the world, India, the United States, and Indonesia, uh, by population, these are the three largest democracies in the world. And it's interesting that we have, in the case of of India, a Hindu majority country. In the case of the United States, we have a Christian majority country. And in the case of Indonesia, a Muslim majority country. So that suggests right, that it's not just for particular cultures or particular civilizations, but it's actually uh, across the board. It's a universal uh, aspiration. And if we think in terms of human rights, it is democracy is the right of all human beings, not just particular human beings or folks from particular cultures or, uh, or areas. Um, okay, so uh, I'm very eager to hear questions and have exchange uh, with you folks. So for me, this begs the question, of course, of our own democracy and uh, what threat autocracy may be to our own democracy. Yeah, uh, uh, that's... Um, you know, part of the picture. The Freedom House scores, the <coughs> Economist uh, magazine has their own scaling of democracies, and they have also, uh, the data that they, they, they consider has moved the United States also in, in the wrong direction, uh, moving away from, uh, you know, becoming, not becoming an autocracy, of course, but becoming less democratic. This is the Economist magazine's uh, consideration. So they consider the United States a flawed democracy rather than a full uh, democracy. And a few years back, of course, the United States would have been uh, a dark blue uh, country there. So, yeah, th that's part of the global picture. Um, looking at this map up here, uh, is it not uh, true that monarchy is not incompatible 
with democracy. <laughs> uh, the dark blue, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden, England, Canada, and Australia, monarchy. Right, right. So, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so most political scientists uh, would define these monarchies as democracies, uh, so that they're figuratively uh, have, have monarchs, uh, but not in terms of how the government uh, is actually organized. And so I should also point out that most political scientists don't make the distinctions, at least when we're thinking about the, the global picture, don't make a distinction between parliamentary systems or presidential systems or they also, they just put them all in the same uh, big category of democracy. And, and don't make the distinction also between a republic. So some will hear this, you know, oh, well, the United States is more of a republic, it's not a democracy. But political scientists typically would consider all of those uh, different forms of democracy to be uh, 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 all, all, all part of the same uh, type of government. It's interesting also that um, virtually everyone claims to support democracy, and virtually everyone, I've mentioned a couple that, that do not, of course, um, Afghanistan, the Taliban is one, uh, but even um, autocratic states uh, declare themselves to be democracies. So China, for example, it, China uh, insists that it is a democracy. The official title of, uh, uh, of China, you know, the People's Republic of China. So they're making this claim of being de democratic. My personal favorite is uh, North Korea. Um, and North Korea is perhaps, what, it is perhaps the least democratic country on the planet. It, or it's in that <laughs> ballpark of being very, very autocratic and totalitarian even. Uh, but the title, the official title of, uh, Nor uh, of North Korea uh, it's, they, they really layer it up, right? <laughs> the Democratic People's Republic of <laughs> Korea. So they're democratic, they're for the people, they're a republic, and of course, none of those uh, things are true. So, the, are there different levels of uh, democracy within all the democracies in the other countries? Because, like, I know that the United States state by state, we're having varying levels of democracy. And even in the autocratic countries, some of them have local regions where the local regions are actually governed by a more democratic process than the whole country. Yes, that's a great point. That's a great point. And the, the, the data that I've uh, presented here and have looked at from Freedom House, from The Economist Magazine, from the VDEM institution, they just look at at the country, at, at the country level. They don't break it apart by states or by regions or provinces. But that's an excellent, excellent point. Um, and to say that uh, if we could strengthen democracy at the local level or at the state level, at the county level, then that, that would uh, kind of trickle up and we could uh, ensure effective democracy. Uh, at that point. The um, Economist magazine, they create a scale of uh, between zero, uh, zero to 10 uh, and rank, and they have a variety of, of ways to create this ranking system, uh, an independent judiciary, civilian control of the military, free press, all these things, and they create an index and a scoring system to, to highlight the degrees or the shades of democracy. Uh, the VDEM uh, Institute, they measure over 450 variables <laughs> that they, they count and put into their data set to decide to try to figure out um, how uh, uh, democratic countries are. Do you think that with a shift in the world's concentration on fossil fuels, it's going to affect democratization? Yeah, that, that's an interesting point about um, the movement away from fossil fuels in terms of should that, you know, get rid of kind of the oil curse or the resource curse. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I haven't spent much time thinking about that, but that's, that's an excellent point. I, I did want to make the point, though, about China and modernization theory. So, theory. So, all these factors are supposed to contribute to uh, demo demands for democracy and for democratic reform. Uh, middle, huge middle class, uh, urbanization, uh, increased levels of education. And for China, 
check, check, check. That, you know, over the past several decades, that's what's been happening. So uh, is China seems to be the exception uh, to uh, the theory of modernization. But um, modernization theorists might uh, respond by saying, well, not yet. <laughs> and so there's a kind of a paradox for China's government because China insists that it's a democracy based upon a substantive definition of democracy rather than a procedural definition of democracy. So we define, most of us would define democracy by the process, by the process by which the government is chosen. chosen. Are there free, fair elections uh, with universal suffrage, for example? Um, but China would more likely emphasize a substantive definition of democracy. So they were to be saying, hey, um, democracy, does, does the government deliver what the people want? That should be the judge of whether a country is dem democratic or not. And so uh, the Chinese would say, China is far more, the People's Republic is far more democratic than, say, the United States, they would claim, where in the U.S., most Americans are dissatisfied with their government. They, they complain about their government. The government doesn't deliver the goods. Whereas most, I mean, public opinion polls in China, you can't really trust them because they're worried about who's listening and who's asking the question, right? But at least they claim to be satisfied with their government. The government has produced the goods. They've had this incredible economic growth, poverty reduction, et cetera. Um, and so, in a way, though, the, the Chinese government has to continue to deliver those goods, continuing uh, to build the middle class, increase higher levels of education, increase urbanization, all those factors that could potentially lead to its own downfall. So, it, it, and what we've seen with other countries, Indonesia is a great example of this, is that as long as the economy is humming and the government is delivering the goods, then we're okay with authoritarianism. <laughs> but as soon as the economy tanks and we have an economic crisis, and then they start making demands on the government, hey, fix this. <laughs> right. And so uh, Suharto then was forced from power and Indonesia then moves into the democracy uh, camp. Considers Canada, Scandinavia, Great Britain, Australia, full of democracies. I wonder what are the specifics the economist has that rates the United States less? Yeah, in, in their report, they talk about attacks on press freedom. They talk about attacks upon an independent judiciary. They also talk a, a lot about the lack of uh, social trust, that there's been a breakdown of social trust. And this is an important feature from their methodology of what makes uh, a democracy um, a democracy. Yeah, I mean, we have, um, you know, the, the Supreme Court, for example, has never been uh, less popular in the United States. And people express distrust across the political spectrum, from left, from the right, from the middle. Um, and, and also uh, faith in, the, uh, in our democratic elections, right? That huge numbers of Americans uh, discount the validity of elections, uh, of the way the uh, democratic process is working in the United States. So that is partly uh, the, um, the downgrading, part of the reason of downgrading of the United States. Any correlation between uh, degree of democratization and health care, particularly like life expectancy, access to health care? Is it correlated at all with democracy? Yes, yes, and that also is correlated with the level of economic development. So yeah, the um, and and uh, and life expectancies is correlated with economic growth and development, and so the, it's all part of this healthy, wealthy, uh, democratic package that we see. Yeah, and also I should uh, step back a second too. Part of the uh, explanation for uh, the U.S. and other uh, wealthy countries moving in the wrong direction is the rise of economic inequality within these countries. So, it, and that is, so why is this happening? What is going on? So, whereas, Inequ economic inequality globally has been on the decline, 
uh, where poorer countries have been growing faster than uh, rich countries, so they're shrinking that uh, inequality gap. But within rich countries, over the last uh, couple decades, we've actually seen rising levels of economic inequality. And so this uh, it contributes to this idea that the system is working, but only for some. <laughs> the system is working, but for the elites. And the rest of us in the middle class or others have been left behind. And this contributes then to uh, uh, dissatisfaction with democratic political systems. Uh, my question is this. Uh, what about nuclear proliferation, nuclear power? How's that fit into, into the mix, sir? Thank yeah, you. that's a good question. I mean, of course, uh, if we look at the, the nuclear club, right, we see autocratic governments more recently trying to join uh, the nuclear club. But the United States, the UK, France, um, Israel, democratic countries uh, with nuclear weapons, India, and then we have, of course, uh, North Korea is, is the most recent member of the Nuclear uh, Weapons Club. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting uh, uh, factor that I haven't really uh, given much consideration to and, and will. Specifically, how do you think uh, artificial intelligence will impact our uh, democracy? Um, we know it's going to impact the economy hugely, but mm -hmm. what about democracy? Yeah. Yeah, the, the impact of artificial intelligence on, uh, on, on democracy, I wish I knew. <laughs> it's a disappointing answer. It's a great question, and you know it remains to be seen. As I said, it obviously makes it easier for autocratic leaders or authoritarian wannabes to limit information or to, to limit the, the message or control the message uh, and manipulate uh, perhaps public opinion. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I have concerns about that. It was interesting um, to me the the uh, CEO of the company that came out with ChatGPT, uh, OpenAI, I believe is the name of the firm. He was recently, this past week, in Washington, D.C., giving testimony. And it's rare that you hear industry executives say, please regulate us. <laughs> usually, usually when they go to DC, they say, hey, we don't need all this regulation. You know, let us be. Um, and that certainly was the case with social media uh, giants. I mean, there's a lot of gray areas in everything that everyone's talked about here, including yourself. So there's no real certainty. You can't really come to a conclusion about any of this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think the conclusion is that uh, democracy is under threat globally around the world, um, that authoritarians uh, and authoritarianism seems to uh, be developing. But in the long term, uh, and that seems to be uh, not really widely disputed, there's widespread consensus about the empirical uh, reality of that. Um, you know, some would say, uh, well, what to do about this then? Uh, for some, democracies need to support other democracies. So, for example, uh, many critics would say the United States, the West, uh, other rich democracies should have done more to prop up the democratic system in Tunisia, rather than just kind of standing aside and letting that democracy uh, crumble. And there seems to be what we call a kind of a snowball effect or a demonstration effect, all right? So the, the problem doesn't stay contained to one place, uh, so that more needs to be done by supporters of democracy uh, to, in fact, uh, support democracy. And the war in Ukraine could be seen through that lens as well, that here you have an authoritarian who's kind of trying to destroy a fledgling uh, democracy uh, in Ukraine, and that the democratic states need to come and to join this battle, not just for, it's not a battle necessarily for Ukraine, although it is, uh, and, and, but it's a, a, perhaps a, a bigger part of this battle uh, for democracy against authoritarianism. My question kind of takes off from his question. What responsibility or what roles do individuals play in ensuring that their democracies stay strong? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the, the role of individuals. Now, individuals can uh, obviously participate ourselves. Uh, we, we can make demands and hold our governments accountable at the local level, at the state level, at the national level. But also there are a, a number of uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations that work to promote 
democracy around the world. Freedom House is one of them. So you could you know, join Freedom House or join a human rights uh, uh, advocacy organization uh, like Human Rights Watch and, and contribute uh, to the support of democracy around the world, uh, not through government, but through uh, individual um, non-governmental organizations. Our son is in Honduras with the U.S. Army Civil Affairs Division. Can you comment on the what's going on with the government in Honduras? Is it a dictatorship or what? But yeah, the author um, Hurtado, who is the leader of Ecuador, writes in this book that it's it's the same story. Right, it, it, that the, the authoritarian leaders uh, make attacks on any unit, whether the, in government, outside of government, that could limit or check their, uh, their uh, use of power or uh, abuse of power. And my feeling is, my sense is the same thing is happening uh, there in Honduras. And uh, yeah, democracy, I mean, when I graduated from uh, Hope College, in 1991, you know, uh, there was only one not non-democratic country in the Western Hemisphere, Cuba. And now we, you know, it's that is not the, the same case anymore. We're seeing movement in in the wrong direction, and I think Honduras is certainly uh, a part of of, of that trend. Um, I did want to say one, tell a little anecdote here. I know there are lots of folks who who are, want to ask questions, and the questions are very good and helpful for me to think through these issues. Um, but I remember in 1989, it was the fall of 1989, in the midst of these uh, democratic revolutions of Eastern Europe, uh, and the fall, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the collapse of communism in the region, I happened to be um, in Philadelphia uh, doing an internship uh, semester as a college student. And um, Lech Walesa, the leader of the Solidarity Movement in Poland, and the first uh, freely elected leader of Poland after the fall of uh, communism there. He was uh, touring the United States to drum up support <laughs> and, and, and goodwill uh, for the new uh, democracy in Poland. And so uh, he was making a public appearance in Philadelphia. He was walking from Constitution Hall to the Liberty Bell or vice versa, I can't recall. And so I tried to encourage my roommates, uh, hey guys, come on. This guy is, you know, he's on the cover of Time Magazine. He's a world historical figure. You know, our great, 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 great grandchildren will be learning about him in school. Like, come on, let's go see him. It's so exciting. And they, I, I went by myself <laughs> to see him. And, and I was just in awe of, you know, I'm coming face to face uh, with this incredible uh, leader, uh, world leader. Um, and I remember as he was walking and I got pretty close and I looked and, that's him? I, you know, I'd seen his picture and I'd seen him on TV, of course. Um, and the thing that surprised me that he happens to be very short. Um, and he was, in my mind, this larger than life figure. And just huge. And, and, and physically, he was, he was not. And so it made the point to me uh, that, um, you know, democracy is sustained and depends upon little people. All of us, right? To get back to this other question, right? That uh, you know, he was uh, he was a, a, a dock worker um, and leading a trade union movement, and he becomes uh, a world uh, uh, hero in terms of the movement for democracy. So I always uh, took encouragement from that <laughs> that democracy depends upon little people. Do you see a pattern with populist movements in power? and how they might slide on this scale? Yes, yeah, excellent question about p uh, populist movements. And so, this, and this is important because when an autocratic leader attacks the, uh, the checks on his power, whether it be legislative, judicial, from the media, or whatever, oftentimes the supporters of these populist leaders are in support of those behaviors because these elites or these other institutions are keeping the voice of the true people <laughs> and the, the, the true people the, it's, uh, not allowing their, their voices to be heard. So these populist leaders then are, are, are supported because they are ignoring the elites or these institutions and trying to push um, the, the popular uh, opinion uh, through. Or, um, and so this is also is an important point to make 
a lot of, uh, of the uh, writing and commentary about populism is about right-wing populism, but the same phenomena we see on the left. And certainly in Latin America, uh, where leftist populists are utilizing this, the pattern, the same pattern, the same te techniques uh, of these other populist leaders. So it's not a function of, uh, it doesn't seem to be of right or left, but a function uh, of populism itself, which at root is an attack on elites and in favor of the regular people or th the masses. I would, I would be interested in your professional opinion about the electoral college and whether that's a threat to democracy in this country. Yeah, uh, a question about the uh, electoral college and um, whether it is in itself a threat to democracy. It certainly is anti-majoritarian. Right? So there are many features of the US system that are uh, somewhat anti-majoritarian, making it very difficult for a majority to get what it wants. <laughs> the very separation of powers and the checks and balances system is a, a kind of an anti-majoritarian uh, viewpoint. And so some would say that it's essential, right? The, the f thinking of the framers that if you want to prevent tyranny and protect liberty, how do we do that? We have to decentralize power. We have to spread out power. So the Electoral College is one way that that's done. Uh, to get, make sure that each state has, in region and area, has uh, a, a, a element or a bit uh, of power. The separation of power system, as I mentioned, um, the uh, federalism as a, uh, as a way of organizing government. So some power is in Lansing, some decisions are made in Washington, D.C. But it's consistent with this decentralizing of power, and that is essential, according to the thinker, thinking of the framers uh, to prevent tyranny, uh, and that tyranny could come easily at the hands of a majority rather than simply uh, at the hands of a king or a despotic leader. So how can we prevent majority tyranny? We have to decentralize and split up power. Others, of course, say that the Electoral College is a hindrance to democracy because now we've had uh, a couple you know, uh, of presidential elections determined by the person <laughs> who won by the person who came in second place in terms of the popular vote. So for some, this is how could that possibly be uh, democratic? That seems to be the opposite of democracy. People around the world, you know, students of mine who come from uh, uh, countries around the world, they say, wait a minute. See, in our country, we, we just add up all the votes and whoever has the most votes wins, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't do it that way. Right? <laughs> so there's like, well, they say, well, why is it that the person who comes in second place wins sometimes. Um, and so then we uh, uh, go into a lesson about the uh, thinking of the framers of the Constitution and how not just with the Electoral College, but as I said, with other mechanisms of government all following the same kind of uh, prescription of uh, separating, decentralizing, spreading out power to prevent all the reins being controlled by one group or faction, as they call them, even if that faction is a majority faction. We want to prevent that single faction from uh, tyrannizing the others. Ask me. Uh, you've mentioned uh, Tunisia and its leaning left. How about Afghanistan, where we were for 25 years, and or Iraq? Were the ingredients for democracy not present? Yeah, I mean, certainly not in Afghanistan. I mean, if you look, it's a very, very poor country, <laughs> very low levels of education. Uh, so it didn't bode well uh, for democracy. Also, a factor that uh, works against uh, democracy or seems to be correlated uh, with the lack of democracy are countries that are societies that are deeply divided ethnically. And so we see that in Afghanistan, we see that in Iraq. And so for some scholars, that helps to explain the failure uh, of uh, the United States in its um, effort to democratize uh, those two countries. And that stands in contrast to the successful um, democratization that we saw, that I mentioned at the end of World War II in Japan and in Germany. So for some folks, the, the, the failures of the U.S. Uh, project in Afghanistan and in Iraq um, show that forced democratization, democratization, you know, at the uh, point of a gun, it doesn't work through military invasion and occupation. But for others would, would say, well, it, 
it, sometimes it does, right? And looking at uh, the successful democratization of Japan and Germany uh, after World War II. But one thing to note, again, is that in Japan and in Germany, especially at the end of World War II, you had deeply uh, ethnically homogeneous societies, right? So, you know, 90, whatever, 9% of uh, the Japanese are ethnically Japanese. And so you don't have these deep ethnic divisions. So, whereas, say, in Iraq, right, where you have Sunnis and Shia, you have Kurds in the north, and so uh, these divisions make democracy much uh, less likely than in ethnically uh, homogeneous societies that don't have those deep uh, divisions.